Chapter 9, Gay Complicity, quote, Many individuals who have had considerable homosexual experience construct a hierarchy on the basis of which they insist that anyone who has not had as much homosexual experience as they have had or who is less exclusively aroused by homosexual stimuli is not really homosexual, end quote. Many gays insist they're the only real homosexuals because a bit of same-sex horniness or experimentation in straight men does not make one fully homosexual, per the situational homosexuality excuses. This artificially deflates the very numbers that would allow for more social acceptance by virtue of it's not a crime if everyone is doing it. This masochistic desire to exclude and minimize is not a recent phenomenon. The first openly gay man, Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, in the 1860s originally estimated the number of gays to be 1 in 500, or 0.2%. While a generation later, the early 20th century sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld pegged the number at around 2%. Current gays, like Dan Savage, now acknowledge that previous numbers estimating 1 in 10 people to be gay were exaggerated. However, the still oft-quoted 10% has an interesting backstory that shows gays downplaying their numbers, contrary to claims they are exaggerating for political purposes. While the 10% figure comes from the research of Alfred Kinsey, the first gay man to use it was Harry Hay, the founder of the Mattachine Society, the first significant gay rights organization in the United States. In the Society's first manifesto, Hay wrote, quote, we, the androgenines of the world, have formed this responsible corporate body to demonstrate by our efforts that our physiological and psychological handicaps need be no deterrent in integrating 10% of the world's population towards the constructive social progress of mankind, end quote. However, if we look at Kinsey's work, we don't find a claim that 10% of males are gay or homosexual per se. In fact, Kinsey prefaces his findings with, quote, Males do not represent two discrete populations, heterosexual and homosexual. The world is not to be divided into sheep and goats. Not all things are black nor all things white. It is a fundamental of taxonomy that nature rarely deals with discrete categories. Only the human mind invents categories and tries to force facts into separated pigeonholes. The living world is a continuum in each and every one of its aspects." End quote. Furthermore, for Kinsey, the graphical representation of this continuum was a scale from zero to six, with zero exclusively heterosexual and six exclusively homosexual. The 10% is then the number of males who are, quote, more or less exclusively homosexual, i.e. rate five or six, for at least three years between the ages of 16 and 22. However, why didn't the early gay rights movement pick the total of twos through sixes? Surely. If they wanted to inflate the total as they were so uh, accused then and now, Kinsey's research provides them with much higher numbers. Ratings 2 through 6 are 25%, for example. So why pick the smaller number? Such a baffling choice is also ironic since Kinsey, on the very same page as his 10% claim, cautions against exactly that minimization, quote, On the other hand, there are some persons who would not rate an individual as really homosexual if he were anything less than a 5 or a 6%, end quote. While I, while I agree with Kinsey that sexual behavior in and of itself is not indicative of any type of person, Science through childhood gender studies now shows us that gays are in fact different, people with gender shifted traits. As such, gays do feel different from other men and thus mistakenly conflate their sexuality and gender. Because they feel that their gender and sexuality are part of the same thing, it creates a group identity around these shared traits. If you like men, you're at least a little bit feminine and vice versa. If you're not feminine, you must not be really gay or a real homosexual. You may like sex with men, but it's not your real orientation. You're just in it for the sex, money, or women aren't available. Maybe they're all in the bathroom or something. Or so goes the game on the matter. We have dealt with the ridiculousness of situational homosexuality, so no need for repetition. However, as with purposely reducing the numbers, gays dismissing other men's same-sex relationships are not as not real or not uh, isn't new either. 
Ulrichs created a category of men called urinaesters, straight men who only situationally engaged in homosexual acts along pretty much the same nonsensical lines as now. Arguing against laws forbidding same-sex relationships, he made the case that biblical prohibitions in Romans 1 against sex between men only apply to sex between non-gay men as same-sex sex was unnatural only for them. So much for solidarity and not throwing masculine men under the bus. Hirschfeld promoted the term pseudo-homosexuality to delegitimize the very real relationships between men and listed the same tired excuses used since then. Both of these men could see culture denying gays their natural inclinations, but their allegiance to the idea that other men who liked men must be part of the small feminine minority blinded them to the fact that most men would like other men absent Christ or culture. Today, we see the likes of outspoken gays like Dan Savage still promoting the idea that men can have sex with men and still be considered straight because incidental sex is experimentation, not real, and just the product of getting too drunk. But why do we continue to ignore the very real culture that tells men not to have sex with men and associate such acts with femininity? Why would we expect more than incidental contact given the repercussions, hostility, and even the lack of terminology to adequately describe the full gamut of masculine relationships? Much of this gay cluelessness about masculinity derives from their effeminacy. They lack first-hand knowledge of masculinity. Some of the labels gays use give their superficial understanding of masculinity away. Take straight acting. It refers to masculine gay men who could pass for a straight guy. But you don't look or sound gay, would be the response. By this, gays acknowledge that gays are not masculine by default. More importantly, who's acting? When gays come out of the closet, they often become more effeminate as time goes on. Good for them. In their child and adolescence, the masculinity that was forced on them becomes an act. As such, they project their having to act masculine onto anyone who is masculine. If you are masculine, you must be acting just like I did. Well, that's simply not true. The book Straight Acting by Angelo Pizzotti gives a glimpse into the gay mind's conflicted and contradictory attitude towards masculinity. The, bo the book aims to turn gay men away from destructive masculine aping, a phony disguise, quote, there is no point in trying to be something you're not. The inauthenticity of straight acting can be sensed, end quote. I could not agree more. I've seen plenty of gay men who claim to be straight acting, but are really just a bit less effeminate than the stereotype. The book, for example, quotes Lance Bass as identifying as straight acting, and yet no one would have a hard time identify, identifying him as gay from a five-second video or audio sample. Yet even other gay men are not, not even other gay men are fooled. Quote, if Lance Bass is, is a straight acting gay, then I eat pussy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. End quote, says uh, Perez Hilton. Gay men are effeminate and should be in no way and should be in no way burdened to act a certain way to please anyone else. They're fine just the way they are. However, the author, like so many people, including non-gays, inflates gay with all things same-sex, male-on-male. For example, quote, And what about this personal ad, straight, man, straight men exploring their lust for other men? I don't know about you, but I'm a little confused. Doesn't, quote, their lust for other men make them gay, even if it's just a little, end quote? No, because gay is a gender and not merely a sexuality. As such, men can have sex with only men, and still not be gay. Pizzotti then acknowledges that gay is more or less effeminate. Quote, Sadly, a large number of us try to stamp out our gayness to appear more straight, masculine, or normal so we fit in. We downplay our gayness even after we admit it. There's a gay-straight blending that many of us do to be more accepted. Afraid to stick out too much, we try to blend like chameleons. At times, we may offset or balance our gayness with masculinity. The use of such normalizing or I'm gay but I'm just like you strategies makes it hard to tell if, you're really, if we're really progressing socially and assimilating into mainstream culture or if we're actually doing a type of social conforming, in which case we're moving backwards." End quote. But if gay is effeminate and liking men is gay, even if it's just a little bit, then the logical conclusion is that if you like men, you are to some degree also effeminate. 
Is it then any surprise that genuinely masculine guys fashioning themselves as straight who want to try something new avoid the gay label? Of course not. While it's legitimate to question their straightness, they are not gay since the two are not opposites on the same scale. Muddling the lines between sexuality and gender does not help. It makes masculine men less likely to have sex with other men openly, whether greros or gays. Whereas some gay men make excuses for why straight men having sex with other men are still straight, Pizete uh, uh, goes the other extreme. But would masculine men who have sex with other men benefit from the advice below? Quote, in being straight acting, we muffle the so-called feminine parts of ourselves. Gay men uh, may be programmed not to be too obvious, shunning others like us and steering clear of them to avoid trouble. Unlike sex, we can't easily hide our appearance, mannerisms, and voice if we allow ourselves to express ourselves naturally as men who are gay. So, to avoid potentially serious consequences, many of us try not to look too gay, behave too gay, or sound too gay in public. We're straight acting to save face. Many of us are gay here and behave more masculine there. It feels safer. While it may be more comfortable, this no femmes attitude separates us from the gay or feminine part of ourselves and puts a wall between us and other gay men, becoming an obstacle to finding true love. End quote. Do we feel part of this we? Do we feel part of his we? No. While this is good advice for gays, greros are not feminine. Masculinity for us is a being, not an act, just as feminine is natural for gays. Pizzotti is not alone in assuming effeminacy in gays or even same-sex inclinations in general. Harry Hay, while appearing in a glittering scarf, gives this advice to young gays. Suggest, among other things, that we must begin to quit imitating the heteros as much as we do. And I think as far as the younger people are concerned, they've got a big step up on all of us because they haven't taken on as much of the of the frog skins that they've had to, that most of us have to wrap ourselves in in order to get through life. That I've always said that we should tear off the ugly green frog skin and find the beautiful fairy prince underneath. And I hope all the young ones find the beautiful fairy prince tomorrow. This view goes along with the label queer, not inappropriate since Harry Hay later founded the Radical Fairies. The dictionary tells us that queer is, quote, strange or odd from a conventional viewpoint, unusually different, end quote. Do Greros feel strange? Do we feel like we have frog skins? Do we muffle any feminine parts? Do we even have any feminine parts? Well, if you don't know about, the, about history, you may think your like of other men is unusually different, but gender-wise, Greros do not feel out of place with other men at all. We are the 90%, or were and will be. For gay men who wish to conflate all same-sex sex and effeminacy, where does this confusion come from? Because gay men lack any first-hand knowledge of masculinity, they have a rather superficial view of it, not unlike some women. For Pizzotti, stereotypical masculinity is the problem, a disease. Quote, masculinity is the villain behind straight acting, end quote. In fact, he thinks gender roles are completely made up. Quote, Think of gender roles and masculinity as a sort of routine mass conformity like something out of Pink Floyd's The Wall. Everyone follows the rules. If you're born with a penis, you're male. Our masculinity, on the other hand, is not something we're born with. It's something we're taught to develop. It's a social invention. Masculinity is a socially constructed set of expectations based on one's being male. Since masculinity is learned, it can be unlearned. The masculinity of the real man is a mask that boys and later men grow to wear to some extent. It's a man's facade, not his true nature. The true self hides behind the protective armor of masculinity forged by society. Behind the hard shield lies a man's true nature, a soft, gentle, sensitive, emotional, kind, loving human being." End quote. If gender roles are entirely made up and not attributable to at least in part to some biological innateness, why do ga gays fail so miserably at masculinity? Why does science show that gender nonconformity in boys is the number one predictor of adulthood gayness? While the specific manifestations of masculinity do differ between cultures, that variety alone does not point to a singular cultural genesis. 
Languages are different, but there are enough commonalities, i.e. universal grammar, to conclude a genetic basis for language itself. Think of universal gender as a rudimentary seed that is the same across all cultures. The specific end result will differ, but even then one can see the shared commonality. For example, of 122 culture studies, males exclusively made weapons and 121. Surely, this cannot be a coincidence. A universal masculinity must be the responsible agent. Masculinity is inborn according to the conglomeration of research. In The Essential Difference, Simon Baron Cohen makes the case that, fe that the female brain is more wired towards empathy, while the male brain is towards systemizing. This is why seemingly disparate occupations like surgeon, internet startup founder, and repairman are almost all exclusively male-dominated. These occupations all require tinkering. Could there be bias? Sure, but that's unlikely. While the number of female surgeons have risen by only 7% in the last 40 years, almost half of all medical school applicants are women, meaning women are choosing subfields in which less masculine tinkering is required. Men are simply more aggressive. The feminists hypothesize that this is the result of nurture, not nature. Men are not, natural, uh, men are not naturally, but are raised to be more violent. But has taking away toy guns and competitive sports at recess produced less masculine violence? No, if anything more. By repressing perfectly natural masculine urges, the feminist seeks the impossible to remake man and her feminine image. Such a project is bound to fail and create the same kind of resentment that gays feel when they're told to act less faggy. And what hypocrisy? Is femininity an act? Why do gay men and feminists assume that they are genderless or, th or that their gender is the pure unsullied form? Why do they assume that masculinity is just the unnatural deviation from this one true gender? If straight men are so easily inoculated by society to wear the completely phony mask of masculinity, in what society were gay men raised? What antidote, antidote do gay men have against cultural prescriptions of masculinity? If masculinity, if masculinity is just an act, why are gays so bad at it? Why is it that all our differences need correction? And by what means? Reparative therapy, perhaps? The self-unawareness oozes. So how about this? Gays, including in childhood, can be feminine to their heart's content. Fag it up as much as you like. But to reciprocate, men and boys should not be castrated of their masculinity. To take away a masculine boy's toy gun is as offensive as taking away an effeminate boy's doll. Social engineering from both sides ought to be rejected as totalitarian horseshit. In short, masculinity is not an act. That gays felt uncomfortable being masculine when they're actually more feminine shows that quite clearly. Or the transgendered who feel different from the gender they were assumed to be based on their biological sex at birth. If gender roles are assigned by mass conformity, why can't gay men or transgendered or the transgendered conform? Why do they innately feel different? And why is it that most men don't have existential problems about their masculinity and don't yearn to throw off their frog skins? Pizzotti has an interesting ad hoc rationalization, quote, Just as straight and gays resent the queens, it's conceivable that straight men are envious of gay men in general. They may resent us for gender trading. This could explain in part their hostility towards us. They may be stuck in the prison of masculinity. Relatively speaking, we have a freedom they don't." End quote. So this is still a case of projection. Because gay men had to act more masculine as children, since their gay gender was obvious in childhood and oftentimes disapproved by parents and peers, they're resentful of masculinity itself. And they should be resentful, but not of masculinity itself, but rather the culture that imposed it on them. Gays do not owe their problems to masculinity any more than a thermometer causes a heat wave. There needs to be a separation between what one is and what one ought to be, descriptive versus prescriptive. 
For gay men to question our deep-seated being is hypocritical since this innateness is what they claim for themselves. Gays are born that way, but so are we. To try to destroy masculinity with throwing a belated passive-aggressive hissy fit in adulthood serves no one. Some gay men are not dismissive of masculinity and either want masculine men or want to be masculine themselves. But their lack of first-hand experience uh, of masculinity reveals itself to be superficial. Look at the homoerotic artwork of Tom of Finland, who drew pictures of men with exaggeratedly masculine attributes, bulging muscles, oversized genitalia, in a variety of stereotypically masculine dress codes. Policeman, lumberjack, motorcyclist. Quote, Believing that a man could be strong, happy, manly, and homosexual, Tom of Finland began to formulate the prototype that has become the quintessence of gay masculinity the world over. His great achievement was then seen as having liberated gay men from the shackles of femininity and unnaturalness, end quote. There is a certain veneer of masculinity, but it's always struck me as very shallow. Why does a biker wear leather? Not because it's cool and pretty, but because leather is a great insulator against the wind. And that's the difference between phony masculinity and genuine masculinity, function over form. Well, Pizzotti dismisses masculinity as both undesirable and non-existent, he ironically clings onto it with all fury. Quote, You have the power to opt out of masculinity, thus making a better life by redefining manhood and being yourself. Being gay doesn't equal being less masculine, so there's no part of you to restrain. We must change our negative beliefs that being gay is less manly. End quote. If masculinity is a villain, why not abandon it outright instead of merely redefining it, at least for gay men? How can you redefine a villain, and why would you want to? Why not start from scratch? And did Pizzotti uh, Pizot not argue that because gay men tone it down, they are in fact la less masculine than they put on? What's wrong with being less masculine? Aren't women less manly? Is there anything wrong with them? Why hold on to false prescriptive notion that masculine is good instead of the scientifically correct descriptive notion that masculinity is this and that without value judgments? Pizzotti does not manage to make a clean break between the prescriptive and descriptive. Quote, All men gay or straight have been socialized to believe that to be overtly gay is unmanly and shameful. End quote. Overtly gay is not shameful, but it is unmanly by definition. In other words, Pizzede and gays like him should take his own advice. Quote, there is no point in trying to be something you're not, but that has to apply to everyone, gay men and masculine men.